October 12th, 1492. A date seared onto the hard drive of humanity. Spanish sailors discover land, leading them an Italian, Christopher Columbus. Maverick, hustler, with his own dream to find a shortcut to the east. His plan to sail west to China. He calculates the journey from Spain will take him just 21 days. He underestimates the distance by 7,000 miles. What was striking about this is that any educated person at the time would know that Columbus was wrong. Undaunted, convinced he's right, Columbus has been all over Europe begging for support for his journey. Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella throw some money his way. Barely enough to fund the expedition. It's kind of the way that uh, a wealthy person might bet a hundred bucks on poker, you know, without much expectation, but you could afford it. After five weeks at sea, close to starvation, thousands of miles from his target, he reaches land, which he believes is Japan. In fact, it's the Bahamas, off the coast of a vast new world. The Americas. Two worlds, isolated from each other for 10,000 years. It's not only a huge event in history, but it's a, a huge event in the history of life. The Bahamas are home to the Taino people. He sees these people, for the most part by European standards, very tall, very healthy, very good looking, you know, living in a state of abundance. Columbus records their first encounter. The people kept calling to us and giving thanks to God, as if we'd come from heaven. I presented them with some red caps and beads. They were much delighted and became wonderfully attached to us. Living in a different ecosystem for thousands of years, the people of the Americas have no immunity to a deadly threat. Disease. Europeans were sort of swimming in this bacterial and viral soup that was utterly unlike anything over there. First contact with an invisible killer that will one day change the destiny of the new world. But Columbus is on a search for treasure. I kept my eyes open and tried to find if there was any gold. Oh, okay. Not then gold. I saw some of them had a little piece hanging from a hole in their nose. Oh, oh. I gathered that by going further, I'd find a king who possessed in great quantities of gold. A little video there, of course, on Christopher Columbus, you know, who changed everything, I guess, in the world uh, with his discoveries of course, in the Americas. So anyway, welcome you back. Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week out there. Of course, I guess it's 
what week two we're in right now at Baton Rouge Community College. Uh, so anyway, um, it's like we've got a lot of students watching right now, uh, like we usually with with particular uh, lecture series. But uh, it's like Logan's watching right now. Hey, hope you're having a great morning uh, out there, Trevor. Good morning. Uh, also, Violet's watching also as well. Uh, Brian, Brianna, uh, Shakina. Hey, good morning. Uh, Hayden. Good morning. Uh, Rowan is also watching, and Max uh, also uh, looks like Alicia is also watching. Uh, Alex, hey, what's going on? Yeah, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, Tijuana, we're doing great out there, and also Michelle also watching as well. Uh, also in StreamYard right now, we've got Miracle, uh, Jeannie, Grace, and Michaela also watching uh, as well. So I hope everybody's having a great morning uh, out there. Uh, looks like looks like I've got some more here too. Looks like Julie also joined us. Uh, as well. So uh, anyway, uh, as you know, uh, of course, my, uh, last week and this week, we uh, did have uh, two lecture series, of course, on the Reformation. So hopefully you've already checked that out, uh, those lectures, if you haven't watched them yet, you know, once you only know, watched them live already. But we do have a Canvas quiz on that, of course, which is uh, due, I think, I think that's due what next week it is, I know now. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, that's the main thing y'all need to work on. Uh, also, the contract policy page, uh, if you haven't turned that in, uh, that needs to be turned in by, I think, tomorrow night. And I think I'm going to close that because uh, I'm kind of working on attendance right now. Uh, kind of see you, I guess, showed up for this particular class. Uh, so make sure you get that, of course, done uh, for that. So main two things right now, contract policy page, the vote, and, of course, the reformation also, you should be working on your first vocab, which will be later uh, due next month, early next month, because September is coming up pretty quick, uh, if you know that. So anyway, yeah, um, yeah. if anybody wants to join me in StreamYard, of course, there's the link uh, right there uh, below. Uh, if you have any comments, questions about this lecture or any other lecture, of course, you know, previously, let me know. If you have an administrative question about the class, you know, please email me. I think most of you have my email address uh, overall. So let me know if you got any comments, questions uh, about anything, uh, whether it's this lecture or whatever. So what are we doing today? Of course, uh, today I'm going to, of course, be talking about uh, world exploration, which will be kind of part of a two-part lecture series this week and going into next week. Uh, week three. So we'll talk about the so-called age of discovery or age ex of exploration, as it's often called, uh, which starts really in the 15th century, uh, goes kind of all the way up to around the 18th century. So we'll kind of go into that. So Western Europe really gets into exploring, you know, the whole world, not just the new world, but other parts of the old world as well. So I'll kind of go into that uh, and discuss, you know, kind of the early stages of it. I'm going to get into and talk about the Portuguese and also Columbus's expeditions, of course, that kind of affect the world uh, in general. So uh, anyway, um, so yeah, I've got, a, of course, another lecture series PowerPoint. You want to look at that later uh, that I've gotten. Age of Discovery is the common name uh, that they usually call world exploration. Uh, when does it happen? Uh, predominantly it happens like I said, starting in the 15th century, you got all these European countries like the Spanish, uh, the Portuguese uh, get involved, the English, the French, also the Dutch as well get involved on exploration. Uh, usually called the Age of Discovery or Age of Discoveries. It's called multiple names. Uh, it starts really in the early 1400s, like maybe like 1420s. I think it's about the time of when it starts and yeah, it does go up to like the 18th or even 19th century uh, with a lot of discoveries uh, that were involved. But these are, yeah, the usual usual major powers. But obviously Spain and Portugal, we'll talk about those two today uh, the most. Th those are the ones that really got it started, especially Portugal first. And then Columbus kind of got it going with his discoveries, of course, of the New World uh, that followed after that. Now, if you look at the, this particular map I've got right here, uh, you can see um, it's kind of like a like a map of the. I'll get get into like the influences you know that really happened with exploration later. But I want to first talk about you know the uh, kind of looking at the old like the map of the world that we know it today. 
uh, overall. Like in in you know back in the 15th century, very little was known about you know the actual world itself. I think most people knew that the world had you know like Europe itself and part of Asia, and then a lot of people thought that you know there was this northern part of Africa uh, that existed. Uh, so very very little was known. I think just basically this whole area here and. Maybe people have heard of China, I think, by the time of the 15th century and things like that because of trade uh, prior to it. Uh, but, um, but there's like, you know, there's a lack of information about all the other continents. So, so nobody knows about the Americas. Uh, nobody knows about Australia. Uh, no one knows about the southern part of Africa. Africa was kind of still considered the so-called dark continent, which it would be uh, for many years of course, nobody knew about the Pacific Ocean and uh, Antarctica and all, all those kind of things uh, that y'all, of course, heard about later, Greenland or anything else you can think of uh, that, of course, people know about now, uh, today. Uh, in fact, a lot of people thought that the world was either flat or not as large as it is later. Uh, of course, uh, you saw in the video how most people now know how big the world is and all that and how long it would take to get to, obviously, to get to China going west. You, you can't just go there because you got the Americas. But of course, nobody knew that, of course, back back then. It's like Amber's joining us also uh, this morning as well. So um, I want to talk about, of course, the fact that, yeah, the, the, the Europeans had come to the Americas. So you probably heard about the Vikings, right? The Vikings, you know, around 1000 CE uh, because of Leif Erikson. Uh, had discovered part of, they think, the Americas, which was, they think, part of Canada, eastern Canada at one point. They actually had a colony there at one point, but the Vikings later abandoned it because of, I think, part of the cold climate, but it was also because of the Native Americans that were, I think, continuously attacking them. And so they abandoned it. Uh, and so you don't have really Europeans come back until, you know, 500 years later. Uh, so, you know, you've got Native Americans living there have been living there for 10 to 15,000 years uh, as a culture. And so we'll get to it later. You know, Columbus's expeditions are kind of, you know, controversial later because of we now what Columbus Day that people celebrate now. And I think a lot of natives want to call it Indigenous Peoples Day uh, instead of, you know, about that October 1492, October 12th or whenever it is, uh, basically. Now, I want to get into and talk about uh, like the influences, like some of the things that kind of influenced uh, uh, exploration to kind of start. I've got a kind of bunch of things I've got listed there that were kind of like factors that influenced exploration a long time ago. Oh, uh, yeah, you see the Crusades. That's They think that's really one of the first factors that really influenced exploration later. If you know about the Crusades, uh, they happened in the 11th to the, about the 13th centuries. You kind of go up to the 14th centuries a little bit as well. Uh, these were a series of holy wars where Catholic Europe tried to take back, you know, the Holy Land like Israel. Uh, but it, what it did, if you know about it, and the reason why the Crusades are kind of important uh, is because of the fact that the Europeans came into contact with a lot of the trade routes that came from like the Silk Road in the east. Uh, and so, you know, about they brought in things like silk, you know, spices, gunpowder, uh, those kind of things that the, you know, the Chinese had uh, in the East. And so that was very vital in really changing, you know, later what happened. Uh, I think that they say pepper is one of the big things. Uh, pepper, uh, like black pepper you think of now, you put in food. Uh, it's one of the main things that they wanted the most. Spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, things like that, of course, uh, you've heard about as well. You see that also in that picture, of course, the Renaissance uh, as well uh, is another thing where you have this, um, you know, this whole, you know, re redoing of, you know, uh, civilization and culture in Europe uh, at the time. Uh, it's kind of this revival where like, like Europe began to restudy the past, like the classical revival of like Greek and Roman literature, et cetera. They think it led to, uh, the Renaissance, which started in Italy, spread to Europe, that led into like the new modern period uh, after that. And um, it created new ideas, uh, of course, later, like the, the, the actual, um, 
the actual printing press was one thing, of course, that was very famous. Uh, you know, Johann Gutenberg in Germany created that, uh, which uh, was helped print books uh, in general. Uh, yeah, map making, you see the Caravel, I'll talk about that later, also developed uh, the Astrolab. Uh, Compass, of course, came into Europe from Asia, from China, as examples. So you got all these different things that kind of are new inventions that really helped to kind of change later um, what would be world exploration. So um, another thing that's a big influence as well uh, is the travels of Marco Polo uh, that you had, the travels of Marco Polo. Uh, that, if you know about Marco Polo, he was this uh, Venetian merchant that uh, went to Asia. He explored Asia uh, and China. And he was actually under the time of uh, uh, Emperor Kublai Khan, who was the ruler of China in the late 13th century. Uh, he was like a powerful minister under him. And uh, he returned to Italy. And apparently when he was in prison, uh, this man who had heard stories about his journeys to Asia uh, created a book or wrote down a book that became known as The Travels of Marco Polo. And so that particular book was very influential. It influenced a lot of other explorers later, like Christopher Columbus was probably you know influenced by it, et cetera. I think Columbus had a book, he, a, the book of that that he brought on his voyage, I know, to uh, you know the Americas. And so that was definitely a, a book that really was a, was a major influence. And Marco Polo was very important because uh, they think that Marco Polo helped to uh, open up a lot of the trade between Asia and Europe again. And so a lot of the Italian like cities like Genoa, you know, Venice, uh, and others you've heard of, Florence, et cetera, in northern Italy uh, began to dominate a lot of the Asian trade uh, between the east and west and they, they kind of became like the middle bin uh, between, you know, the trade with Asia at the time. Uh, oh, there's another thing I will talk about book-wise that's kind of important that I think they think that influenced also Columbus as well, and that's Claudius Ptolemy. He was this famous uh, geographer, uh, an astronomer that was in uh, Egypt uh, under the Roman Empire, and he wrote this book called Geography, uh, and it actually had this atlas in it that's very famous. Uh, that's You see there in that picture, uh, which was kind of depicted like the first map of the Roman Empire, but it was seen as one of the first, it was seen as one of the first um, maps of the world. Uh, and so uh, they believe it uh, influenced um, Columbus later, because I think they say Columbus read that book uh, also as well. And I guess he thought that if he sailed westward, you know, he would he would reach the eastern side of this. Because I think Ptolemy talks about this great ocean that exists here. And I guess Columbus is thinking if he sails this way, he'll get over here somewhere uh, on the eastern side of the map. So uh, anyway, um, so those are kind of some things that kind of, you know, influenced, obviously, uh, Columbus's uh, voyages and other explorers later. Oh, uh, there's one other thing I did want to mention about where is it, which is uh, right here. Uh, they think that another influence that really created exploration later uh, was, uh, if you know about what happened with the Byzantine Empire or the remnants of it, it was uh, they were eventually conquered by the Ottoman Empire in 1453. Uh, and so a lot of the trade, like the Silk Road, was running from the east, from China, uh, through Constantinople and the Black Sea. Uh, and so when the Turks conquered it in 1453, that cut off a lot of the trade between east and west because now the Turks controlled it. So, yeah, the Italians weren't the middlemen anymore. And so you got all these European powers like Spain and Portugal and others that want to try to seek alternative sea routes so they can get the spices and all that uh, from Asia. Uh, and so that's that's they say that's one of the main reasons why exploration occurred uh, after that. Uh, especially with the Portuguese trying to go out Africa, Columbus trying to go west uh, to Asia. And so that's that's definitely a major impact on why that occurred. Uh, looks like uh, Carlette's joining us also this morning. So I hope you're having a great morning. And Sophie's also joining us as well. So coming in. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of talked about some of the influences that kind of 
factors that kind of caused expiration uh, later. Uh, other things that were kind of an influence I did want to mention about uh, as well. Uh, that was a big, that was kind of an influence as well. Um, I believe there's the one I'll kind of, it's not in there, but they do think that Christianity was another influence, believe it or not. You know, when the Europeans start discovering all these new lands, Africa, Asia, uh, part, you know, the Americas later, they're going to want to try to convert everybody. So the Spanish Portuguese were the main ones that really try to convert everybody uh, to Christianity. And if you look at the Americas, most of the Americas is mostly Christian, like especially in the Latin America, they're all Catholic just about uh, because of the Portuguese and the Spanish. So that is something that was kind of a factor later uh, in pushing exploration, of course, later. So um, let me get into also discussing some other things that were kind of a factor later uh, in exploration uh, as well. Uh, technology, don't forget about that. Technology played also a major role uh, in exploration uh, as, we as well. There's all kinds of things that, you know, enable exploration uh, to occur uh, in the world. I'll kind of talk about one of the main things that they really had that really probably was the biggest thing, I guess, naval-wise that, that caused uh, exploration. That, of course, was the invention of the caravel you know, which the Portuguese helped develop, uh, which is pretty important, uh, the Caravel. Uh, and um, the Caravel uh, was a type of uh, 15th century ship uh, that was, uh, they think went back, was influenced by the Middle Ages uh, by different ships like like in like Europe and I think it also in North Africa uh, by a lot, of the, a lot of the Muslim countries. Uh, and... Um, these were types of um, ships that were that had like these um, latine rig type sails on them or Latin sail, uh, they called it, and it allowed ships to sail windward, like into the wind. Uh, they also had like a movable rudder uh, you can see as well. And of course, later on, a lot of these ships were uh, heavily armed, a caravel, <coughs> excuse me. We're often armed with like you know cannons, uh, rifles uh, in general, <clears throat> and um, you can see most most ships uh, to sail uh, windward. Uh, they had to uh, zigzag their ships, so they had to tack into the wind, uh, or what they say would beat the wind uh, as well. And so, a lot of their speed and capacity was you know was ham was you know prevented by the wind, and so they had to zigzag and so oftentimes it would take you know a ship to go vast amounts of distance it'd take them a long time if they had to go you know uh, into the wind now if it's down if it's downwind of course uh, you know it was a lot easier you know for them to actually you know go uh, one one direction or whatever um caravels on average varied in size I think like on average were about 40 just 40 to 60 feet was about the length of a caravel. Uh, and um, tonnage, maybe about 80 tons uh, at the most. Crew crew was usually about 20 to 30 men. Uh, so a lot of these ships are very small, uh, very cramped quarters. Uh, had uh, the, Spanish, the Portuguese and Spanish did develop ships later, a little larger than that, called a gnaw or a carac, which was about maybe 80 feet. 80 feet in length and maybe had a crew of 50. But a lot of these ships were like the forerunner of the so-called galleon ships. You may have heard of later, which is multi-deck ships, which um, the Spanish and others were kind of known for in the future. I think gal galleon means large ship in Spanish. So caravels were interesting. The fact that they were able to sail these long distances you know, across the Atlantic and I think the Portuguese under Magellan sailed around the world in some of these types of ships uh, in the future. I was up here before, and uh, yeah, other inventions that were big as well, uh, I want to mention is the uh, so-called Astrolab uh, that they have. Uh, hey, Brittany, good morning. Uh, and um, anyway, the Astro Astrolab was something that went back to the Middle Ages. It's been around, but 
Uh, by about the 15th century, they started to be used a lot uh, to navigate ships. And uh, you could use these instruments to uh, tell the angle of the sun to figure out where the ship's latitude was. You could also tell time, like what time it is of the day uh, by the angle of the, the sun uh, and things like that. Uh, and so that was one invention that was pretty vital uh, with sailing. Also, you can see the compass was another thing, of course, that originally came from China uh, that was also important uh, as well. And so that, that enabled ships to navigate in a certain direction, whether they're going west, uh, east, north, or south, whatever. Uh, that was something that's real important as well. Uh, also, uh, map making, I did want to mention that too as well, because you know, map making is something that really uh, is, is pretty important uh, with with you know, early exploration in general. And uh, they think that the Italians were some of the first to develop maps, especially for, you know, naval exploration uh, in general. You may have heard of the so-called Portalon chart, or actually called Portalani, usually with an I on the end. And uh, these were charts that kind of went back to the Renaissance uh, that were the first to be made uh, in Italy. And what it did was it depicted where all the ports were, <clears throat> like where they could sail to, uh, merchant ships or whatever, uh, with trade, etc. And so, uh, most of these, most of these, um, most of these, uh, you know, ports you're looking at were predominantly you can see in North Africa. You can kind of see here too, like hop of Africa right here, <clears throat> North Africa over here, got Europe over here, Mediterranean Sea, uh, England, like Britain and all that over here. So you can kind of start to see different parts of. I guess the known world of the time <clears throat> that was there, made part of Asia over here. You can see Turkey right here in that map as well. So cartography was kind of starting to come in. Uh, a lot of the early explorers like Columbus, uh, Amerigo Vespucci, a lot of them were actually cartographers as well, mapping a lot of coasts uh, in gen general. <clears throat> uh, I was also talking about you know, technology in general, you know, we were kind of getting into, you know, talking about care, uh, the Carabelle and, you know, the compass and the, in the astrolab, but there's other things too, I guess I'll mention that were kind of influential as well. You know, as they take territory, it's going to be easier for the Europeans to do all this because of all the technology gunpowder, you know, played a major role, which came from China. Uh, so they got guns and rifles and cannons uh, steel. It's also something you see later uh, that they have uh, horses, you know, are brought in too uh, as well. That's vital too in the conquest of America. The conquistadors, I think, were the first to bring in uh, horses in general as well. Now, of course, they talked about in that short video on Columbus, uh, you know, germs, like, you know, different kinds of diseases, you know, were brought in like smallpox. And I think measles uh, were some of the worst uh, they were brought in. So that those kind of gave the, you know, the Europeans an edge. And it's kind of seems a bad thing later what happened because it devastated, you know, a lot of the Native American cultures uh, in general, but uh, it gave them really an edge they didn't they didn't, didn't know they had. Uh, you know, I guess you can call that biological warfare uh, or whatever. Uh, but it's obviously something that gave the Europeans an edge that later helped them to conquer the Americas. Because uh, I'll get to it later. They think that after the uh, Europeans came, you know, to the to the New World, it killed off a majority of the of the Native American population, maybe as high as ninety percent, possibly uh, later. And a lot of them were enslaved early on, uh, also. Now I'm going to get into like some stuff on early exploration today. I think the first thing we'll talk about and here's, by the way, care. I didn't. Really, we'll show show you later, but these are replica caravels right here like the Nina and the Penta, uh, which I think they built a bunch of these before. But those are the kind of ships that they sailed early on uh, across, across you know, uh, the Atlantic and also around Africa, etc. Now, I want to first talk about the Portuguese, get into them a little today, because, uh, you know, the Portuguese were the ones that really were the first to, to, to really – start what we call modern exploration as a whole. There you go. Of course, there's a picture of uh, what is Prince Henry the Navigator, <clears throat> who's kind of famous later. Uh, Prince Henry the Navigator is considered to be the father 
of Portuguese exploration. Uh, and uh, he's the one that really starts exploration a long time ago. Uh, you can see he mostly lived in the 15th century uh, as a whole. Uh, his real name is not the navigator. It's kind, of, it's kind of a nickname that was given to him in modern times, I think by these two German historians that started calling him in Europe or something like that. And the name stuck, but his real name was uh, Prince Henrik, the Duke of Bizu. Uh, and he was actually, uh, one of, I think, the third son of the king of Portugal named John I. And he became famous because, if you know about it, he began trying to create exploration and creating a kind of a Portuguese empire, naval empire uh, at that time, exploring like parts of North Africa, uh, getting explorers to also go into uh, what is the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, the Portuguese uh, were very interested, by the way, uh, in um, <clears throat> what is the sub-Saharan trade routes that were going through Africa. They say that's part of why, you know, the Portuguese got involved because it would lead to discoveries in the Atlantic, like in the 1420s. I think one of the first things they discovered, if you know about it, because of, I guess, Prince Henry, uh, was Madeira. They found Madeira for the island there. It's famous for its wine. Uh, the Azores, you've heard of the Azores Islands, of course. Uh, they're in the Atlantic as well. So those are some of the first things that they, they discovered uh, as a whole and um, later, the Portuguese would also discover other things in Africa, gold. Of course, especially like around the Gulf of Guinea, the western part of Africa. Uh, salt, ivory, you know, from different kinds of animals, uh, in like elephants or whatever, rhinoceros. Uh, sugar, you know, like sugar cane and all that, of course, I think grown in Africa uh, as well. And later, you know, if you know about it, the Portuguese and some of these other European powers uh, were one of the first to start the African slave trade. Uh, I think it was the Portuguese and the Dutch, I think, that did the most. I know that. That's something they're kind of known for uh, later. Uh, they think the Portuguese wanted to get into uh, what is uh, Africa. There's a kind of a weird story I did want to mention about, which they always talk about uh, with Portugal. But Portugal had heard this legend, in the, by the, I guess, by the end of the Middle Ages, about this story about Prester John. I don't know if you heard about this, but there was a story circulating from a letter in the Middle Ages uh, that there was this Christian ruler that was living somewhere in the East, and he had asked for aid. Uh, and so the Portuguese wanted to find Prester John, maybe trade with him or something like that. And a lot of the Portuguese thought he was in Ethiopia, believe it or not, which is in the eastern part of Africa. So they sent explorers into Africa like actually by land, not just by sea, uh, trying to find him and all that. Of course, some people think he was in India. Some people thought he was in the Middle East. Uh, some people thought that maybe uh, Presser John was actually like either Genghis Khan or maybe Kublai Khan. And China has been speculated as well, but they don't really know, you know, uh, what it is. But going back to Prince Henry, though, Prince Henry was famous supposedly for creating some kind of navigation school that was in southern Portugal, a place called Sagras. Uh, and um, anyway, um, they think under him and later, I think maybe Vespucci, yeah, Amerigo Vespucci, I think had some kind of school there too, uh, later as well, where they taught pilots how to you know, navigate uh, ships and things like that. And so the you know, the Portuguese started an experiment using the caravel, the astrolab, and uh, things like that, uh, and all that, <clears throat> etc. cetera. Uh, if you go back up to this map I had, which is up here, kind of go to this map, uh, and um, the Portuguese uh, started to first, if you look at this map, explore like the Gulf of Guinea, which they started in the 1460s. Uh, you kind of see it on this map, which is right here, but the Gulf of Guinea's about right here, kind of part of the pump of West Africa. That's about where the Gold Coast is, or what they call the Ivory Coast, <clears throat> which is right there. And so that's where they start finding a lot of gold throughout that area, <clears throat> which is important. And then if you keep going down, <clears throat> which is like uh, here on the bottom, the uh, Portuguese get down like Angola, Angola, Nambia, which is up in this area. And uh, they also find uh, what is like the, um, they find like the uh, the famous Congo River, 
you've heard of, you know, in the Congo area, which is in the bottom, Africa, which is right there. And then from there, they're going to even get down to the bottom of Africa uh, to find where South Africa is, you know, today. So all these areas are starting to explore by the end of the 15th century. So uh, the Portuguese are, you know, trying to figure a way, obviously, to get around Africa. They think maybe this continent here has got to end somewhere, and they could get over here to reach India or the Indies, as they call it in Europe. So that's basically that. Uh, and uh, then you had other explorers uh, that came later uh, that are with the Portuguese as well. I wanted to mention about, uh, you also had Bartholomew Diaz. Uh, he was another Portuguese explorer uh, that on his expedition with like three ships in 1487, 1488, he explored down to the, the tip of Africa, uh, reaching what they call later the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, as they call it uh, today, which you can see uh, is on the bottom of this map here. Uh, originally, Diaz uh, did not call it that. It was actually called the Cape of Storms because it's real stormy on the bottom of, of Africa here. Uh, but the king, the king of Portugal, changed it to the Cape of Good Hope because they realized it was a, it was good it was a good hope that they could then make the turn right and you know sail up the coast and maybe reach Asia uh, going eastward. And so that's why that name stuck. Uh, and, um, oh, he had a famous ship that was well known on that famous first expedition to reach the tip of Africa, which was the Seo Cristoveo, which uh, means in um, Portuguese, uh, St. Christopher. I think it's considered one of the first famous naval ships in exploration. Uh, that's 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 well known. And Diaz would later be on another expedition with Vasco da Gama, where they tried to find you know the the tip of Africa again to reach you know India. And so uh, about ten that happened about ten years later. Uh, you've got Vasco da Gama uh, that comes next uh, as another famous Portuguese explorer. But they think da Gama is considered one of the most famous of the Portuguese explorers. Uh, in fact, he had three expeditions where he sailed to India on well, in the late 15th and uh, early 16th centuries. I think Da Gama and also Magellan, I think those two are considered the, the greatest, most famous Portuguese explorers uh, overall. And uh, his expedition, though, was the first to sail around Africa to reach India. So he's the first European you know, to reach India by sea, uh, by going around Africa, which took, by the way, 10 months. Uh, between 1497 uh, to 98 uh, from the Regent. And, uh, <clears throat> and you'll see later, this is very important, uh, you know, with, with this occurring, you know, the Portuguese are going to enable themselves to create a naval empire, which will later have Brazil, of course, added later, but about well, Africa, part of the Atlantic, uh, part of India, uh, they'll even sail in the Pacific uh, within about, I think, I think within like 10, 15 years after the Gama finds India, uh, you end up having the uh, Portuguese discover like the Spice Islands, the so-called Maluccas, uh, which are in uh, Indonesia. Uh, the Malacca Strait, also in Indo around Indonesia, it's also important where Singapore is, will control that strait, uh, which then allows them to control a lot of the trade uh, in, between India and like China and Japan, because uh, you get the Portuguese or uh, some of the first Europeans to, to enter like China and Japan uh, after that. Oh, they had one more explorer I did want to mention about uh, who's also well famous as well, which is uh, Pedro Alvarez Cabral. If you go back to that map I was showing you uh, a second ago, uh, Cabral was also known uh, for his expedition in 1500, uh, where he discovered uh, what is basically Brazil. I think around April of 1500, uh, he finds Brazil, claims it for Portugal. And so Brazil ends up being added to, you know, the, the Portuguese empire as well. They weren't supposed to get it, by the way. It's supposed to go, I think, the Spanish, uh, but the Portuguese end up with it. And so that's why if you go to, you know, Brazil today, most people speak you know, Portuguese uh, because of that. So it's part of the Portuguese empire for a long time. Uh, up, I think up to like the 1800s, uh, believe it or not. 
Right. Then the main thing I'm going to, of course, get in today uh, that we're going to talk about is Christopher Columbus. We're going to, of course, get into discuss, you know, the fact that Columbus is probably one of the most influential individuals that affected, obviously, exploration the most, uh, especially when you're, you know, you're dealing with, obviously, the New World, the Americas, uh, you know, re rediscovered, you know, by the end of the 15th century. Uh, Columbus was actually not Spanish. You know, he sailed for the Spanish, but he was actually of Italian descent, if you know about that. Uh, I think his real name was usually Cristoforo Colombo, uh, or also called uh, Cristobal Colon. <clears throat> Colon, I think, is often the common name <clears throat> he was actually called. And uh, <clears throat> as you know, <clears throat> he was involved in uh, one of like four voyages uh, to the Americas uh, in 1492, up to like 1506, I believe, is the other three voyages that he would have later. He had four voyages, you know, total uh, overall. And... Um, Columbus' voyages were sponsored uh, by the king and queen of uh, what would be the Spains or what they call the Spanish Empire later. Usually called the Spains, they called it originally, uh, which the two main you know, kingdoms that merged into uh, what would be the Spanish Empire uh, would be the two states of uh, Castile and Aragon. And it was actually Castile uh, that actually uh, sponsored, the main sponsor, of, of, you know, actual the voyage, uh, Queen Isabella. And of course, she had her husband she had married, uh, which was King Ferdinand II. Uh, they were known as the Catholic monarchs of Spain. I don't know if you heard of that before. Uh, they kind of helped to become the, the actual rulers that would kind of unify Spain uh, into one empire. Although really the first Spanish empire's real ruler uh, was not them. It was actually uh, one of their, I think one of their, uh, was like a grandson or something like that. I think later it was, which was Charles V, who we'll get to later. And uh, so we'll get to him uh, a little bit later. But um, Columbus, uh, going back to probably the 1480s, of course, I think it was in the 1480s originally, he had this idea that you could sail westward. It would be like, like a shortcut uh, to reach, you know, uh, Asia, uh, and so Columbus, uh, I think as far back, I want to say it's 1485, maybe or around that time, uh, began to pitch different countries to try to get this expedition up. So he went to like, I think four countries at least. I know he went to, you know, Portugal, Spain, he even talked to France and England. England, by the way, was very interested in his, his idea. Uh, but they ended up, you know, the Spanish going with it instead. Uh, the Spanish were kind of concerned that uh, the, the Portuguese were going to get ahead of them uh, in this exploration thing. Uh, and so um, they decided to you know, keep comms around, like in Spain. And then eventually, as you know, what happened was Isabella, you know, the queen of, the queen of Castile, is the one that eventually decided to uh, grant him this uh, first expedition of, of four. Uh, which, by the way, the original expedition uh, had a nickname. It was called the Enterprise of the Indies, as they called it, because the whole point of the first expedition was to reach Asia, but nobody knew about the Americas, uh, which, of course, we'll see later. Uh, Columbus, of course, was given uh, several ships, which I think I, I kind of uh, showed you some of those before. But if you know about Columbus, his famous ships were the Nina, uh, the Pinta, uh, the Santa Maria. Uh, the first two you see on the left there uh, were actually caravels uh, that were given to uh, Columbus had. And then, of course, the Santa Maria was a gnaw or a carac uh, that was also involved uh, with the expedition, which, which the Santa Maria was actually the main flagship uh, of Columbus on the voyage, which he actually called it La Capitana, which means the captain's ship. And it was the largest of the three, maybe up to 100 feet long possibly, but the, I don't know if the caravels were that big. I think more like close to 60, 70 feet, maybe the longest. Uh, but about 90-something men were involved, uh, basically, with the first voyage. And you would think that, you know, with the first voyage to this, you know, to the New World, that a lot of men would go on this voyage. Uh, they did have trouble trying to find people uh, to go on this voyage. Uh, there was a fear that they wouldn't come back, because uh, most people did not know you know, what was out there 
uh, to the west. Like no, wait, it's like unknown charted lands or waters. Uh, and I think some of you thought the ships might fall off the earth if the world was flat uh, or whatever. Sea monsters, you know, and of course, those kind of stories circulating. Uh, and so um, Columbus was also aided by the way of the voyage by these three brothers. I don't even heard of them called the Pinzon brothers that went along. Martin Pinzon, Francisco Pinzon, and Vin Vincent Pinzon. And, uh, of course, later some historians claim that Columbus didn't find, find the Americas. They did the Penzon brothers. <laughs> so it's kind of a debate about that, about who discovered it or not. So, but Columbus is given credit because it's his voyage, you know, and all that. Uh, the first voyage of Columbus lasted about five weeks. Uh, they, they left uh, Palos, Spain on August 3rd uh, and sailed across the Atlantic on a more kind of a westerly course originally. Um, and, um, I think they think they seem to think they sailed through what they call the uh, Sargasso Sea, which is kind of in the central part of the uh, Atlantic, like south of Bermuda, like between Bermuda and the Bahamas. It's about the area they sailed through. And um, apparently they almost didn't make it, if you know about that on the first voyage. Apparently there was a mutiny that occurred almost near the end of the first leg, you know, as they sailed across the Atlantic and uh, the men wanted to go back because they weren't finding land or anything. So Columbus gave them like a few days. They said, I don't spot land. We'll just turn around and go back. And uh, he also reminded the, he reminded the sailors that, that basically the, the, the crown had given basically a reward, like a gold reward for the first sailor uh, that spotted land. Uh, they also think the Penzon brothers may have helped to kind of smooth over differences between a lot of the sailors in Columbus. And they changed course, kind of more of a southwesterly course uh, instead of more of a westerly course. Uh, however, what happened, if you know about it, on October 12th, they think they first sighted land, uh, which is the Bahamas. Uh, there's actually a man named Rodrigo de Triana. He was a Spanish sailor. I guess it was a lookout on the Pinta. He was actually the first man uh, to sight land. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, he actually went to go collect the reward, the gold reward. And Columbus said, I saw it first. He said he had saw it the night before or something like that. <laughs> he claimed the money himself. Kind of a cheapskate, Columbus. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, they do discover this island, of course, you see there uh, – which is called Watling Island. If you go to this map here, let me go back up, show this map, uh, which is right here. Uh, I've got a map showing Columbus's um, actual first voyage. You can see kind of the route they took. Uh, and um, so the Bahamas uh, right here, uh, San Salvador. Uh, that's believed to be an island that's in the Bahamas chain that's kind of east of uh, Florida. Uh, they think that's where Spanish came ashore uh, originally. Uh, and um, anyway, the term, the, uh, there's different names for San Salvador, which means uh, Christ Savior or Holy Savior, I think is usually what it means in Spanish, which was the Spanish name they gave it. But other names they called it too. Uh, later, uh, the British gave it a name, uh, which was Watling Island, which was named after this guy named John Watling, who was a buccaneer, English buccaneer, uh, who kind of used it as a place like, I think, to, I think to bury his treasure loot or whatever as a pirate, I guess it was. So sometimes it was called that, either Watling or Watling Island. And then the natives had a name for it too. They talked about the Tianu people that were on the island uh, that Columbus first met, which were indigenous people that were, they think, from the Caribbean originally. And um, they called it Guanahani. It's a, it's a term that uh, Columbus wrote down this diary of his voyages. And so that's the other name they called it. But San Salvador is the current name they call it now, either San Salvador or San Salvador Island, uh, basically today. And so that's really the first meeting that you get where, where you know, the you get the, you know, the modern European world meeting, of course, the, the Native Americans and that's what kind of started the controversy after that, you know, with Columbus Day, I guess now today, 
uh, that you've got because of the devastation that would occur later with the, you know, I guess all the disease that came in later. But I guess if Columbus, you know, if it wouldn't have been him, it would have been somebody else, you know, that kind of deal uh, and all that. But um, let's talk more about the first voyage of Columbus, like, you know, what, what actually occurred on the voyage. Cause uh, it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just, you know, uh, the Bahamas he discovered. Uh, there's other islands, of course, that Columbus also discovered as well that were kind of important uh, after that. Yeah, his first voyage, uh, he found Cuba first. Uh, after that, like about, by, I think about November, he found uh, found Cuba. And then Hispaniola was also found after that by December 1492. There were Haiti and the Dominican Republic is, uh, as well. And uh, off the coast, if you go back up here to this map here, off the coast of um, what is, uh, they think, Haiti, like the northern coast of Haiti, uh, the Santa Maria shipwrecked. He lost his ship, one of his sh three ships there. And so he took part of the, the Santa Maria and he built a fort out of it, uh, which became known as the uh, La Navidad uh, settlement, which is like really a fort there, but it was considered like the first European settlement that they would create in the Americas uh, by the Spanish. And he left his men there. And by the time they came back, though, uh, I think they say the natives had, all, had killed all the men. Uh, so actually it failed. His first attempt to kind of create some kind of settlement uh, that was there. And then from there, you can see he sailed back uh, sometime, I guess, January, February, you can see he pretty much sails back to, um, you can see Spain and arrives back in March of 1493. Uh, so all, all the whole voyage itself, uh, you can see, uh, took about seven, eight months you know, to go back and forth on the first voyage. So, so that's the so-called first voyage you know, of Columbus uh, that you have uh, there. Uh, there were other expeditions I did want to mention about uh, that were that were there, uh, which were important. Uh, yeah, his other voyages also explored other parts. You know, if you think about Columbus's voyages, all four of them anyway, he mostly explored the Caribbean Sea, uh, which you know is located south of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and um, Columbus never entered the Gulf of Mexico. Like he never got that far north, like reaching, I guess, what we call North America. And so the areas he explored were mostly islands that y'all know of that are in the in the Caribbean today. Uh, there's just yeah, I've got a bunch of them here, but these are probably the majority of the islands uh, that Columbus discovered at one point: Jamaica, Puerto Rico, Martinique, Grand Cayman Islands, Barbados, Gren Grenada, Trinidad, Tobago, Virgin Islands, Antigua, uh, any other kind of islands you can think of, Lesser Antilles or whatever. Uh, they think Columbus uh, discovered them uh, at one point. But if you go back up here, you know, Central America, you know, he did explore that too. Like I think on his fourth voyage, he explored part of the area of Central America. Third, vo third voyage of Columbus, he found part of the northern coast of Venezuela. He actually sailed into some of the bays of Venezuela. So all this talk about Columbus didn't find America. Yeah, he did. He found like parts of Central America in Venezuela and all that. Well, that's around the Caribbean. So, yeah, he did find the Americas, you know, uh, for sure. Uh, the only thing about Columbus was that he thought he was in Asia. So he thought that this area that he was exploring was actually near, like, Japan or China uh, at the time. And I think he even censored some of his crew after they came back from their voyages, uh, trying to kind of hush up thing, hush up things about, oh, it's not a new continent. No, not not that kind of thing. Uh, it's part of Asia. He really thought that uh, to be pretty much true. I think even on his deathbed, he thought that. Now let me now let me talk about, of course, the things that happened after Columbus. Of course, came back. You know, from uh, you know all these voyages we're talking about here. Uh, now, after he came back, you know, they had this thing called the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, which was done between the Spanish and the Portuguese. Uh, 1494, to kind of blow it up here, but you can see that uh, this particular treaty uh, was something that the Catholic Church was behind, believe it or not. 
The uh, Catholic Church under Pope Alexander VI became concerned because of all these new territories uh, that were being discovered, uh, you know, the late 15th century. And I think the church was more concerned about, you know, people's souls, because they're thinking all these new lands, we can convert all these people to, you know, the Catholic Church and have churches all over the place. Uh, and so uh, they decided to kind of divide the world up into, you know, separate spheres, basically. And so they created this demarcation line uh, that kind of ran down through uh, where Greenland is now. Uh, you can see that map. And uh, the, original, um, the original line ran through that kind of gold line you can see there uh, running down the middle here through Greenland right here. And then they pushed it a little further west, um, I think in a couple years where this blue line is, running down through uh, South America uh, right here. And um, anyway, what ended up happening was that the Spanish ended up getting most of the New World, like North America, South America. So they start calling it later. And then minus Brazil, because uh, you know what happened later on because of Pedro Cabral, you know, the Portuguese end up with Brazil later. And the Portuguese were supposed to get, of course, most of the old war. I guess whatever they find in Africa, et cetera, and also later in Asia. And uh, you can't see it, but this map goes all the way around the world. So it went around into the, like, the Pacific well, on the other side, uh, dividing up the whole world on general, like into two spheres. Uh, countries like France, England, the Dutch, and others that also get into exploration, they don't recognize that treaty. Uh, only those two sides do uh, in general. And they'll try to come in and try to sneak in and, you know, take territory uh, from them also as well. Another thing that's also very famous, you know, about uh, after Columbus's, you know, voyages, you have this thing called the Columbian Exchange uh, you've probably heard about, uh, which was a popular term, by the way, that came about in the 1970s, it's fairly new. Uh, that was coined by this man named Alfred W. Crosby. He was an American historian. He's also a geographer. And he wrote a book, uh, I think it was published in 1972, called The Columbian Exchange. Uh, it's actually a book you can read that's on my book list. Uh, and anyway, what happened was uh, the Columbian Exchange was this transfer of everything between the two worlds, between the old uh, and, the, and, and the new worlds. And so you got all these things in the Western Hemisphere being transferred back and forth uh, between both sides. Uh, and um, if you look at this map here uh, that I've got, you can see that it's, it's anything from like being transferred back and forth. You can see from plants, animals, precious metals, culture, human populations, technologies, diseases, uh, any kind of ideas back and forth. Uh, some of them have positive consequences. Some of them have negative consequences, uh, as you know. Um, and um, blow up the map here, you can see from basically from the old world, uh, you had crops like, you know, all your grain crops grown in the, in the new world, wheat, rice, barley, oats, all came from the old world. All your cattle, you know, sheep, pigs, horses, none of that was in the new world. All that came from, of course, the old world. Your peaches, pears, coffee, beans, turnips, olives, onions, citrus fruits, grapes, bananas, sugar cane, honeybees were brought over uh, as well. Um, so, and then you got all these diseases we talked about smallpox, influenza, typhus, measles, malaria, diphtheria, whooping cough. All that came, of course, you know, from, from you know, uh, the old world. Uh, now we got COVID, right? <laughs> I guess from China, I guess but that's where it came from, I guess, originally. Uh, coronavirus, I guess, now. Uh, then from the, the uh, new world, you've got anything from sweet potatoes, different kinds of peppers, like red peppers, jalapeno, squash, pumpkins, turkey, peanuts, uh, potatoes, tobacco, pineapples, chocolate, bean, different kinds of beans, uh, vanilla beans, corn, potatoes. You got, you know, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, you know, et cetera. So think about it. You know, without all these things, you wouldn't have to have French fries at McDonald's. 
wouldn't have peanuts in your M and M's. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have like a um, pizza, right, with a red sauce. Wouldn't be able to eat uh, popcorn at the movie theaters. No turkey for Thanksgiving. No pumpkins for Halloween. Uh, you know, etc. You wouldn't be able to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. I think they were talking about that 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 video. Remember the Monty Python in the was the Monty Python the Treaty of Westphalia? Uh, they were talking about that high powered narcotic, cocaine. You know, came from the you know about that came from the New World. I think marijuana is from the Old World. They already had that going back a long way. It's been around though. But um, yeah. Uh, oh, later by the 17th century, you'll have this thing called the Triangular Trade Route. That's one thing that's going to start happening. Uh, between Europe, Africa, and, and the Americas, this triangular trade route type shape uh, that kind of comes in where they're kind of trading back and forth uh, between, between you know, all different continents there. So that's going to kind of create all these new trade routes because that's kind of what the Columbian Exchange was, uh, or interchange, they call it sometimes. It was like a new trade route, you know, that they kind of created uh, later. And as you know, uh, the triangular trade route is more infamous for the so-called Middle Passage. You've heard of that, and we're all these African slaves were brought from Africa, mostly West Africa, like 12, 13 million came across like the Atlantic and two, three million died in the middle passage as they got there. Uh, and so, but that doesn't really start till the 1600s, a little later when African slavery comes over because initially they enslaved all the Indians is what they first did uh, in the Americas, but they were so susceptible to all these diseases they replace them with Africans instead of slaves. That's what ends up happening. And yeah, that's one of the sad things about it. You know, they talk about, you know, the Columbian Exchange would end up, you know, causing close to 90% of the Native American population may have died at one point uh, because of all this. So that's something that they kind of talk about sometimes. So that's why, you know, Columbus Day is kind of controversial. And I guess why they want to call it Indigenous Peoples Day instead, because I guess people were kind of feel sorry for him and all that would happen. And <clears throat> but this idea of blame Columbus for it is kind of ridiculous because one guy, you know, causing <clears throat> everything to happen, <clears throat> it could have been somebody else, like another explorer, you know, that could have done it instead, you know, that kind of thing. But smallpox, measles, uh, that that really was the two worst ones I think that came over that probably killed the most, more in general. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> as well, uh, here, here's kind of a slide, too, about Crosby in his book, which, by the way, I think that book itself, uh, they think popularized what they call environmental type history, I guess, studying about that, uh, like that and the Little Ice Age and things like that are kind of similar to that, I guess, that are kind of studied later about the Earth in general, <clears throat> that have to do the environment, things like that, and climate. Uh, one more thing I did want to talk about, too, uh, exploration-wise before I go today. I did want to talk about this guy named Amerigo Vespucci, which I'm sure you've probably heard of him uh, before. As you know, the name America ends up being named after Amerigo Vespucci, uh, who was an Italian explorer. He sailed for Spain first and later Portugal. <clears throat> and um, Amerigo is important because uh, they, they consider him to be one of the ones uh, that was one of the first to figure out that Columbus, his voyages, was not Asia. It was like separate continents uh, in general. And so he started calling it uh, Mundos Nuvos, which um, in Latin meant New World. And uh, it became popular because of a uh, letter that he wrote uh, that was circulating uh, in Europe around 1503 is when he published it. And it became a pamphlet that people started reading uh, throughout Europe. And so um, the word America or Americas or the word New World uh, started to be kind of used uh, after that. I think I got a map showing you um, his expeditions uh, that he went on, which I think were like three, I want to say, that he went on. He went on one first, I know, with the Spanish, uh, where he discovered and explored part of um, what they think is the northern part of um, South America in the Caribbean. And then later for the Portuguese, he explored part of the hump of Africa, excuse me, South America, eastern part of South America, excuse me, where Brazil is and all that uh, right here. 
And so uh, from that idea, is he got the fact that, you know, hey, we're, we're not in Asia. We're, we're, we're in this new continents. And so uh, the term America or America started to be used. But it's kind of weird how the name came about. They think that the name America evolved from his Latin name, which is Americus, you know, Americus Vespucius uh, is his Latin name. Actually, he was actually named for a Catholic saint. Uh, of Hungary named Saint America, but you didn't know that. Uh, so that's kind of where you get the word America from, E-M-E-M-E-R-I-C. Uh, so it's like the Latinized version of it, basically. And so after that, you know, the name the name stuck. Uh, and uh, so, so, you know, you start seeing it, you know, on maps and all that, of course, afterwards, like this map you're looking at here, I think is considered to be one of the first major world atlases that was invented uh, in the 16th century, uh, this guy named, I think his name was Abraham uh, Ortelius. I think he was a 16th century map maker who was Dutch. Uh, he created one of the first uh, maps, which is Typus Orbis Terrarum. Uh, it's very famous. You may have seen it before, uh, but it's considered the first really world map of the whole world at the time. You know, anyway. So, so anyway, it's kind of kind of talking about you know exploration uh, in. Um, Later in the week, uh, later next week, I'm going to kind of get into uh, a part two lecture on exploration uh, where I'm going to talk about other discoveries. We're going to get into, I uh, will talk later about the voyage of Magellan, uh, which I think that one is considered just as famous as Columbus's voyages uh, that are up there. Uh, and then um, we'll also get into somehow the other countries like the English, uh, the French, uh, the Dutch. The Russians, they, they all get into exploration, uh, especially into the New World as well. And that's going to, all this is going to lead into, you know, European colonization uh, into the Americas. Uh, we'll get, the, you know, the conquest of the Americas, like the conquistadors coming in uh, and taking over, uh, you know, uh, the Americas, et cetera. So we'll, we'll, that's something we'll kind of get into later. I think, Kayla, I didn't say a good morning to you, but hey, you're having a great morning. Oh, they're kind of missed that one uh, earlier. But anyway, um, so yeah, next week, yeah, I'll, I'll get more into that. I'll kind of send out announcements later about that upcoming um, uh, lecture coming up, part two. But let me talk about, uh, before y'all go today, don't forget uh, about various, you know, assignments I've got out there uh, right now. Uh, of course, don't forget the contract policy page. That's still out. Uh, I think I'm going to give you till tomorrow night to turn that in. Uh, if you have not done that, so either email it to me or upload it to Canvas for me. Uh, and then also, um, don't forget you have the Canvas quiz number one reformation. Uh, that will be due uh, the beginning of uh, probably next week. Uh, so that's that two part lecture on the reformation. So do go make, make sure go back and look at those two lectures. Of course, back on my YouTube channel. Uh, and all that I did a stream those a while back. Uh, and um, if you have any comments, you know, questions about this lecture or previous lectures, you know, let me know uh, later on. It looks like we don't have any questions or comments today uh, about that lecture, but you know, let me know anytime you know about that. Maybe you do get bonus points for uh, comments, questions, of course, about lectures uh, through my YouTube channel. So do leave me comments, questions as much as possible uh, about that uh, overall. So. That's it for uh, the week overall. I uh, hope you'll have a you know great weekend coming up. Uh, of course, we'll be going into week three, of course, next week. Uh, but I hope y'all are having a great you know beginning uh, of the semester. Uh, but like I said, make sure you get that you know uh, Canvas quiz done on of course uh, the Reformation. So y'all 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 take care uh, and uh, have have a great you know rest of the week uh, overall.